All right, everybody, welcome to Oregon State University Permaculture Design Course Pro. This is our final office hours from the fall and winter 2021-2022 course. Really excited to be going over the final questions with all of you. Everyone who's live, thanks for showing up. Everyone who's viewing this later on, thanks so much for watching. Um, we have a number of questions today. We've got some nice drawing examples we'll get into. We've got a number of projects that um, I've previously done that we're going to show as examples. And that'll hopefully uh, elucidate some of the answers to the questions that folks have. Um, some questions from folks uh, aren't currently on. And so I'm going to wait, kind of skip them and come back to them uh, in case they do jump on, uh, which will be nice to have um, nice to have that conversation. So welcome, everybody. And uh, yeah, great to see everybody's faces here. All right. So jumping into it, our first question is from Tim, but Tim's not here just yet. So I'm going to skip Tim for now and come back to him because it was going to be a live answer. And I want a bit of detail on that. Uh, we're going to jump into Lindsay's question. Um, Lindsay, as we've talked about before, is in Saskatchewan. It's a very wide, very open area. Uh, she was wondering about a list of renderers and GIS specialists. So Paper Street Permaculture is my go-to GIS specialist. I have been evaluating another GIS specialist and will post if and when I feel like they, they've got that ability. Um, Regrarians.org, Georgi Pavlov is a phenomenal um, GIS specialist and really enjoy working with him and the Regrarians whenever I have the opportunity. Um, Pedro is a phenomenal renderer who was in this course last semester um, and is looking for work and is looking to work with others. And this kind of hits on another question about um, how do you go about partnering up with somebody? So it kind of connects Lindsay to your next question. Um, one of the things that has worked best, I think, for most people is gilding, just like the same way we do with our plants is finding individuals who have skills within an area that maybe we don't have or we don't want to have or we're looking to have and then bringing skills to them as well. So um, always looking for individuals and have picked up a handful of folks and renderers uh, from this course. Pedro is the most recent and um, is, is quite good and is looking for work. So um, that could be a good good connection as I as I connect with more. I always uh, fill the roster. Um, local network survey. I've had I've had a disappointing realization after going down the rabbit hole that there's nobody offering permaculture design consultations in my area. That shouldn't be disappointing. That should be an amazing opportunity. That's uh, that's the opportunity when you go. Oh, there's nobody doing this. Uh, welcome to the world of Lindsay. So I think that there's um, a great opportunity for you to step forward in that and to start to build something um, around that conversation. And it sounds like. Had a response of a gal who's offered consults in the past. I know one other person. I'm wondering if you have any recommendations on how to go partnering up with someone else who has their PDC, but is also new or maybe never ventured into his offering of the consultation services yet. So a couple of answers here. Um, one is Jamie Wallace and I are going to be hosting a post PDC session, which everyone's invited to, which we will uh, send out during uh, through the Canvas um, email service. So make sure to jump onto that and I'll put it in the, the link below. It's going to be... Um, a webinar and we're going to be doing twofold we're going to be talking about next steps but we're also going to be asking about what people are interested in learning about designing uh ecological landscape business be it on the small scale or the large scale we've been thinking about offering a series of of post pdc workshops um jamie's phenomenal he's worked in the industry for almost 30 years he has an award-winning um landscape design company and he built uh permaculture into it about five six years ago and now he's just him and his wife, Angela, are just stunning in the work that they do. Um, but the first and foremost is, is this idea of partnering. So one of my examples here, and I think it's in this presentation, is um, Lindsay Meads, who took a PDC with me down in um, Cuba. It was a 21-day PDC where we went through all of Cuba. There she is. Um, and had just a phenomenal time learning from our Cuban compatriots. And um, basically, we had a conversation where she had uh, some pretty interesting zones of brilliance. So I'm going to introduce you to a concept, which I believe I've got a video on the course, all about zones of brilliance. And it's a good, good reminder for everyone. So when you're taking a look at zones of brilliance, it's similar to the zones that are on our landscape. So this is more about our, our personal zones or our business zones. And 
um, there's, there's kind of these three areas within our zones of brilliance. There's our perennial passions. So the things we love to do. And so within permaculture, there's going to be things that you just, every time you come up to it, you enjoy, and it might be earthworks. It might be, um, might be propagation. It might be uh, passive rainwater harvesting. It may be active rainwater harvesting. It might be social permaculture. You may have a number of these different areas that you just love. And it's really important to note those things down. And we talked about this previously in a, in a different office hours. We were talking about that compost and that fire list. What really fires you up from this course? Then there's that idea of the inherent gifts. So what are your gifts? What are the things that you bring to this work? So maybe you're an analytical thinker. Maybe you're a great researcher. Um, maybe you're an amazing admin. And maybe you speak the design language or maybe you speak uh, city and ease. This is the, the parlance that uh, city employees um, uh, speak and being able to speak city and ease is really important if you ever want to work with the city. And then there's perceived problems. So what are the problems that are out there and what's the cost of those problems? Now, something that we all went through uh, during the site challenges um, assignment was what are the problems and what are the costs of those problems? And I ask that question of all my clients when I start, what are the problems that you're coming to me to solve and what is solving them look like? And two, what is the cost of solving those problems? Now, for Lindsay, this is really important. And for anybody else who wants to create a design business, because that gets to the heart of two really important questions. One, is the client clear enough of the problems they're trying to solve? And two, are they motivated enough to solve them? If the cost is 10 bucks and your design services start at 45 an hour or 75 an hour or 175 an hour or 275, whatever it is, it doesn't matter what your prices are. Uh, their cost motivation isn't high enough to engage you. So within this zones of brilliance, this places where you inherently come alive, there's this sweet spot where there are perennial passions, your inherent gifts, and then the perceived problems that the client or society has at large overlap. And I like to joke that in every PDC, and sorry, sorry, gents, but it's usually two or three young men who are going to go off and create a food forestry business. It's kind of without fail. There's always two or three. And, uh, and I love the enthusiasm, but my question is always eligibility. So I remember the last time this happened and I said, great, have you ever planted a tree before? And the three or four of them said, no. I said, oh, interesting. Have you ever created a business before? No. Have you ever worked for yourself before? No. Okay, well, you're not currently eligible for a food forestry business, but your enthusiasm makes you eligible to build the skills that are necessary to have that business. So one of the first things I do when I'm working with somebody about building a new business is I get a sense about what is their absolute far reaching goal here? What is their objective? And what are the skills or processes they need to have inherent to themselves to be able to achieve that objective? And then we go through a process of building that. And I've done this with soil food web consultants. I've done this with um, ecological uh, eco village consultants. A lot of folks come to me because they know that I've, I have skill in helping people build businesses. So one of the questions we were talking about within this compost and fire list was taking everything that you've taken from that fire list within the compost and fire list, fire being the things that fired you up from the PDC, compost being the things that, ah, they were great, but for somebody else and they'll come back as compost or soil sometime else. And to really ask three questions, um, do, I do I enjoy this aspect? And usually if it's in the fire list, it's a yes. Do I have skill in this? Maybe yes or no. And am I more for this? And this is hard for people because we're asking a question that's not common in society, which is if I do this thing, if I enact this thing, if I research this thing, am I more enthusiastic at the end of it than less? And what's interesting is sometimes we enjoy things, but we're not more for them afterwards. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a matter of personal essence connecting with an outward perspective. So some of these case studies, um, this was a great one. This was a student who was in a, a PDC, I guess, taught at, at the end of, they had a passion for permaculture and food. They had a gift of organization and motivation. And the problem was there was no good local food access. And they asked me at the end of a PDC, if you were going to start a business in this city, what would you start? And I had been in the city. I'd lived in that city before. I'd no longer lived there anymore. And I said, well, there's only two things I would do. I would do a mushroom business. I would do a gourmet mushroom business, or I would do a food aggregator. And that's where you connect with farmers and you bring food together to bring local food to people. And without fail, I would say probably 45 to 55% of the cities in North America could use this type of business. And so Jay created this incredible company called Farmbound. Um, and uh, this is one of the tools I created called the 1010 by 100 within 10 days. Um, 
of your of your course with no more than 10 hours and hundred dollars of your local currency go take a step with your pdc i'm not talking about more drawing i'm talking about go take a step and put something in the ground go reach out to a bunch of folks have a bit have a have a session where you create an introduction to permaculture but go do something with this there's a lot of infotainment out there where we go and we take educational conversations and uh yeah, Jay's just done phenomenally well. Um, there was another great colleague of mine who had a passion for remediating soil, had a gift for writing and interviewing and storytelling and had no remediation. Uh, there was no remediation resource out there. And so she created this amazing book called uh, Earth Repair, Lila Darwish Earth Repair, I think is up there. Um, she's now the um, disaster response coordinator for New Orleans. Uh, and this is the one that I was thinking of for you. Um, or when you asked your question, Lindsay, was uh, Lindsay Meads, also also named Lindsay, um, down in Cuba. She had a passion for city spaces and permaculture. She had a great gift for urban planning. She was an incredible uh, technical uh, drafts person. And there was no permaculturalist working on a city level with city institutions. And so she reached out to um, Adrian Buckley of Calgary. And we, we chatted about this and, and I thought it might be a good connection and it turned out really well. He had a company called Big Sky Permaculture, um, and Lindsay is a phenomenal um, big thinker, uh, you know, great um, project manager, speaks city and ease, it's just phenomenal. And so they married their businesses. They actually had a public marriage of their two businesses and came together, and uh, they created Re Regenerate Design. And uh, now they work, uh, not exclusively, but they built the backbone of their business on working with institutions and creating nature play spaces that also had an edible component. So that way there was a curriculum tie-in with students who could come out and work different number of beds or even full production beds, but then they also did natural play spaces. So, you know, these conversations are about finding the sweet spot for you. And that's why I want to give you a process instead of telling you exactly what to do, because I don't know exactly what you should do. But you really take a look at your, your passion. What are your perennial passions within this space for um, Trina Moyles, amazing author, um, has written a couple of really phenomenal books. She had a passion for women in agriculture. There was this gift of writing, interviewing, storytelling, and there was no source for um, women in permaculture stories. There was just nothing. And so she created this amazing book called Women Who Dig. Um, and uh, this was before the book was out. This was in... Sanctus Spiritus, she was a uh, teaching assistant in this PDC that Ron Barazan ran that I helped uh, co-teach. And so she went and each chapter is um, uh, different women in different countries because uh, women are the original agriculturalists. So you kind of see where I'm going here. Um, another case study, um, great student of mine, uh, had a passion for expressing designs, was an illustrator and became uh, my go-to uh, renderer. He would, he would render my designs and was just phenomenal at doing it. So really when we're taking a look at this and some of you might've even reached out or heard of um, Diego Footer's work, um, Diego had a passion for epic shit. He was always on it. He's moved on from that, thank goodness. He had a gift for interviewing, had a curiosity and loved exploring. And there was really, you know, 10 years ago, there was a lack of, of concrete examples of, of permaculture businesses and farms and all the rest of it. It was really hard to find these these examples that didn't look like messy gardens or um, outlandish hippies. That being said, I have very good friends who are outlandish hippies, but they don't always create the best optics for a design process out in the world. So he created Permaculture Voices, and now he has a, a podcasting empire and um, a number of different courses and you know just phenomenal. So Lindsay, my suggestion to you is really to take a look at your perennial passions, to take a look at your gifts and to take a look at the need around in your area and to um, find that, that niche and then start to make offerings. So these can be simple offerings to friends and family first. This is where I started um, saying that I will design for free or cheap um, as long as you put it in the ground. This is important. To create a good business, you have to have design examples. And so that allowed me to put projects in the ground. It allowed me to um, build a lot of capacity in a short amount of time. And the other thing I did, and this may be actually a really good fit for you, is I created Permaculture BC, which is still online. It's now more a, uh, uh, it's a hub. I turned it into a hub for permaculturalists in British Columbia. And it became my bachelor's of permaculture. And what I did is I invited in 
um, experts. Um, and I did this uh, in person. If I was smart 10 years ago, I would have done it in person and online at the same time because I'm doing that now with regenerative living.online. But when they came in, part of me hosting them for a course was I got hours with them. And so I got hours to learn with them. I got to connect with them and they became mentors. And they also became people who wanted to hire me. Uh, they knew that I was excited. They knew that I wanted to do this work. And so I just showed up with more value than they were expecting. And they started to be interested in, in hosting me. And it was a, a really great way of building more capacity in a short amount of time. Um, this whole presentation goes on and on. And I think this is one of the things we'll offer during this, this webinar coming up. Um, secondly, do you have any recommendations about how to go offering myself as an apprentice? Yeah, so there's a concept here that I picked up years ago that all opportunities have to be an opportunity to learn or an opportunity to earn. And depending on my financial situation, um, sometimes I would take opportunity, I would go build decks or run wheelbarrow just so that way I had food. <laughs> and then on the other side, there was the learning. And that was actually more important to me. So if there was a, if there was an opportunity to learn and earn, that was high graded. If it was just learn, but not earn, like go and spend, I don't know what I spent $3,000 to go over to the Kermaterhof in, um, in Austria to go spend some time with Sepp Holzer and Josef Holzer. And then found out there was a second course that was only in German that I could go and attend, but it was hands-on. And so I, I wouldn't spend two, three days in a German only class that I can't, I, I can't understand, but there was individuals there that were willing to do a little bit of translation and understand. And it created connections in that course specifically that have lasted for 10 years. And now I'm um, the, the great friend I made chef Seth Peterson. We're now doing an entire series of eat well courses because of that connection. So there was about a three, four year span where I was just a traveling troubadour and I was learning wherever I could, whatever opportunities there were. And I basically took the income I produced from all of my earning and my learn earn jobs. And I plowed it back into education as much as possible. Um, within that learn earn conversation, a couple of years ago, I, uh, I developed a regenerative business mentorship with a colleague of mine, Rob Avis of Verge Permaculture. And there's a number of podcasts from Diego Footer still about this. And I'm going to be offering something um, on this within probably 2022 and there's kind of three stools in business there's the sales and admin work there's the the office work there's reputation building and there's the craft and what a lot of people do especially in in permaculture related regenerative living fields is they become super enamored with this work because of the the craftsmanship or the crafts uh, itself but they don't think about, well, what's the reputation building? And a, years ago, I was asked to speak at a natural building colloquium, which is a conference for natural building. And um, I, <laughs> I told the organizer that there will be two parts to my presentation. One will be 30 seconds. And if they still want me to talk, then I can go for an hour and a half. And my 30 seconds was, I know most of you don't want to hear this, but if you're not willing to hang a shingle and tell people what it is you're doing, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. And then I said, if you'd like me to keep speaking, I will. And if you're totally offended, I can stop talking and I can go and talk to a great number of people who are in this colloquium that I'd love to chat with. And it's an important piece if you're not willing to build your reputation in what you're doing. And however you want to do that is the way that works. I highly recommend uh, Tad Hargrave, marketingforhippies.com. Uh, Tad's work has been instrumental in me understanding my niche and how to present my niche and how to how to share that with people. I've specialized that with that now because I know it quite well. But basically, the marketing that works is the marketing you'll do. Um, I don't like blog writing, never have. I've written maybe four blogs in my entire life. I don't mind doing video. I love doing audio. I love doing podcasts. And that's what works. I love speaking in front of people. So whenever there was an opportunity to speak in front of folks, I just said yes, um, even if they're not, not paying me. And this is where uh, social media is amazing. You know, you can do a, you can do an office hour like this, or you can do a presentation on, um, on YouTube. And if 10 people show up, that's incredible. That's 10 people who you'd normally in the, in the pre social media, pre YouTube world, you'd have to gather together to speak to. So there's something within this permaculture framework, the passion, the gifts, 
the problems that you love and you've specialized in, or you want to specialize in it, and learn it, and you want to start sharing that with people and teaching people. That is a great way to get yourself known in short order. And you build all three at the same time. You build reputation, you build craftsmanship, and you're actively building your sales funnel because you basically have everyone who comes to your business is a yes, a maybe, or a no. And you want to sort the maybes into the yeses and nos as quickly as possible. If you go to the allpointsdesign.ca about me good fit page, that good fit page has saved me more time than anything else in my business. For the very fact that I've just said, you're a good fit if you're this, you're not a good fit if you're that. And so my conversion rate of people who reach out to me is about 95%. If people call me, about 95% of them work with me. Before I had that good fit call, the conversion rate was about 60 to 50%. That meant that I spent a lot of time on the phone talking to people and what I, I use is called a good fit call. Good fit call has a number of points to it. And you guys went through it during the site assessment. One is uh, give me an overview of who, who you are and what your site is and all the rest of it. Tell me what your problem is. What's the problem or issue you're trying to solve? If, if we're on an intersection and I'm the lemonade stand at the intersection and you cross me and you pay me money and you walk away with the lemonade, what is the lemonade in the situation? What needs to change for you? Um, what are the obstacles to that problem? This is a really important question to ask folks because if they don't know what's in, in the way of them, then they'll ch the chances are they won't, won't really understand what it takes to finish it. And sometimes that question makes them ineligible to work with me. What's the cost of the problem? And what's their big idea? What's the big ideal outcome of this conversation? And that ideal outcome is their sense of utopia. And that gives you a sense of if you can work with them, if you know, or if you don't know that you can bring them their sense of utopia, or if you can bring them a portion of your utopia, I've had this before. I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating a, a large farm right now to work with 6,500 acres. And it's been a long process of evaluation, both for them and both for us, because it's a big job. It's going to be just the feasibility study is going to be probably six months and going to take some travel and whatnot. So you really want to evaluate those, those conversations and make sure that people are really well suited to you. So um, I would say if you, if you can reach out to a conventional landscaper that's doing some of what you want to learn, be it irrigation, be it um, project management, be it material setup, be it estimating, be it, you know, whatever it is, whatever that big grandiose idea of what you want to build is, and you take a look at the, at, at the skills you need to garner and you find a local company that's hiring, or you reach out to them proactively and say, my name is Lindsay. I'm really interested in creating an ecological landscape design business. I know that it's based upon the back of conventional landscape design. So I'm really interested in working with you. And here's, here's the things I want to learn. Could I do that with you this season? Is that possible? Do you have an opening? Uh, take some cold calling, but uh, it works out phenomenally well. Other option is if you want to work in a urban setting uh, for a little bit and you want to do some relocation, um, I know at least of two companies that are currently hire, hiring. One is uh, Hatchet and Seed Contracting over in Victoria. They're looking for new people for the season. And the other one in Victoria as well is uh, Edible.Design, Edible Landscape Design, Josh Wagler. So that's how I would go at it if I could go at it again. <laughs> Pretty big answer, but there's that sort of big picture and then the small picture. Does that, does that help? It helps a lot. I was thinking I'm going to need to sit down and really like analyze, like you said, what, what did I like? What didn't I like? What do I want to learn more of and, and figure out where I'm at with all that kind of stuff. So yeah, this gives me a good way to move through that. Awesome. Great. Good to hear. Any follow-up questions about that from uh, Lindsay or anybody else before we move forward? Okay. Seeing bobbing heads, but in the opposite direction. Cool. Uh, zones. <clears throat> So we had a question about zones here. When mapping proposed zones or, or the concept, are you mapping out the final zones, less maintenance, or the zones in the first few years? Lots of watering will be needed for years one to three. Orchard will be planted. So usually what we'll do is we'll do specific zones for design at maturity. Um, I could see the value, though, you saying that. I could see the value of saying what establishment zones would look like and what you might put closer to home. I think that's a great, great thought and a great point. So I, I really like that. Um, gray water release area. I'm having a hard time seeing what the best area method would be to release the gray water at the two shelter belts on the west. 
They currently only have only the water line run over there, but this spring we'll decide on the final placement and how it's released. Page 177 on my slide shows a possible idea. Okay, great. So we're gonna go to 177. And west side, let's compass northwest. So orchard area dugout. Up on the about top third on the left there. Top third, up here? Um, the two little blue triangles on the left. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, right, yeah. So that's a pretty long run for gray water. Um, normally, what I would do is I would do what's called a branch drain system um, directly off of whatever the takeoff is of the house. Now, um, usually, the way a house is plumbed is all of the all of the fixtures are plumbed together and there's individual P traps on all of the fixtures. So that way gases don't come back up into uh, the house. Um, ideally what you'd want is you'd want uh, a takeoff that takes only the sinks, uh, bathtubs, uh, washing machine. That's technically what we're looking at. Gray water, gray, uh, dark and light gray water sinks are uh, kitchen sinks are dark gray water, bathrooms, light gray water, because, once you start putting food scraps into to water, uh, it can become septic really quickly. Um, so you'll you'll have to take a look at the plumbing, and sometimes you have to do individual gray water takeoffs because the house isn't set up that way. So my house, uh, the way it works is our washing machine is upstairs, but it immediately plumbs into the uh, toilet, and so unfortunately, there's no way for me to tap into it without it coming into the toilet. There's no head height, but my kitchen sink has an area where this year we're planning on putting in a three-way ball valve. And this is important for cold climates because with gray water, you have to turn it off during uh, the winter months, unless it's at frost depth. Um, and if it's at frost, frost depth, all of a sudden that gray water is at a lower level that doesn't necessarily um, create advantage for the area. So that plumbing will go into what's called a branch drain system. And so basically directly off of that, all, graders, all, all gray water is at a one to four slope. So four units of run, one unit of rise drop. You always wanna keep it moving. Uh, stagnant gray water goes septic and is one of the most disgusting things in the world. And that's having helped my friends raise children. So just saying. Um, Whenever you split with a branch drain system, you want another drop. So basically you want to encourage drop, encourage flow. And then what you end up doing is you go down into an upside down bucket. So it's like a five, um, it's a five gallon or a two gallon uh, potting, um, a, a pot. And then basically that pipe comes down at the top and then there's an abortive air zone. So that way that water can fall. If that water ever is, that pipe's ever directly at the ground, what will happen is the roots will find it, they'll come up into the pipe, and then that's it for your branch drain water system. So I would take a look at uh, this uh, evergreen deciduous shrub and wind and snow fence here. Um, I would look at using it directly here or using it for the acute willow along riparian area for more windbreak. I would use the water and put it right into um, application right around the house. So the like, where the, I guess, where that blue line ends, like right on the west side of that shelter belt in the middle there, sure. that's actually where they've already got it plumbed to okay. like the water line sticking up out of the ground for the moment. It's just kind of chilling awesome. until they get that set up. So yeah, I was just wondering if, like, if, if I, sh if they, they were thinking about just releasing it right there, but I was wondering if we could like figure out how to direct it to the like do like a branch drain, but to the two different areas or something like that? Or Yeah, for sure. Um, and this is a water calculation. So, you know, it's a bigger question because you'd have to get a sense of how much water do they have? What's the drop over there? What's the height of it? All the rest of it. But you may be able to do um, an infiltration trench. And so what happens is this is a trench that has, um, what was his name? Ian. Uh, On-site... RWOT, Registered Water On-Site Technician. Um, these are the type of people you'd want to reach out to. I'm just going to see if I've got, yeah, okay. So what this looks like is it's a big upside down, very, very long upside down trench. It's a big plastic. Uh, and the pipe is actually connected to the top. And it's um, perforated. It's like big O. 
and it's graded. So basically it has a fall to it. And so what happens is if you, let's say this is this water line and you bring this water line in, this would fall away here and you could do another one this way, like so with a pipe in it as well. And basically you could branch that water this way and that way. And if the trees are in between them, like so, that would be a great way to use that water productively uh, and use that for that shelter belt area. What did you call that again? Infiltration trench. It's been a long time since I had to think of that. And um, yeah, if you send me an email, uh, javin at allpointsdesign.ca and remind me, I will look for I Ian Todd. There we go. Ian Todd, registered on-site water technician, ROWT. Um, if you look him up online and you may want to also look up in the same Google search, Gord Baird, B-A-I-R-D, um, the two of them have, have done quite a bit of work, Ian more specifically in um, gray water uh, infiltration trenches, which I think because of the number of trees you have would probably be easier than doing a branch drain system. Like branch drains are, are nice for around the house, but once you get to larger plantings, you want to be able to distribute that water easy, uh, easy, easier. Um, so I would take a look at that or I'd reach out to a registered on-site water technician in and around your area and see if they have experience doing that. I would say that would probably be the way to go. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Great question. Thank you. Uh, a couple other pieces, Art Ludwig's Grey Water Oasis, great um, book. Uh, and yeah, we went through all of that. Okay, awesome. Questions complete. Question number one. Uh, Lenny, ground cover. I'm trying to create a ground cover bed on my site where I can spread some mixes of seeds to serve a series of functions. Windbreak, water retention, clay, soil, breaking and aeration, nitrogen fixing, pollinator, wildfire, uh, pardon me, wildlife attractor, uh, pest control, edibles, biomass, and dynamic accumulator. Uh, my current strategy is to create two different seed mixes. The first will be focused on close proximity. Here's a link to the list of my site. So we'll pull that up so everyone else can see it as well. Great, so we've got our, our ground covers here. We've got sunflower, corn, peas, beans, horseradish, daikon, parsnip. Parsnip and daikon are my, my go-to for soil, um, vegetative soil decompaction. Caraway, yarrow, queen's ends, lace, alums, marigold. Yeah, this is a great list. I'd probably put in some clover, probably some white or some crimson. I might also work with... Um, uh with pioneer pea uh, it's a nice um it's a nice pea it has quite a bit of vitality uh and like i was saying in the answer here i would start with a small amount and then innovate out from there um a little bit of a conversation about bioaccumulator i know the course talks about bioaccumulator or dynamic accumulators but the gentleman who came up with the concept um, and, uh, and Bill Mollison got a hold of his book, uh, recently, like in the 20, ought, ought five. Yeah. 2005, 2006 came out and basically disavowed dynamic accumulators and a colleague of mine and I, we went down a big rabbit hole to see if dynamic accumulators, if there was any science behind them, um, and couldn't find any, it was a really interesting conversation. So it's one of these things that whenever I see them, I was like, ah, oh, should I say anything? Um, but generally we do have like nitrogen does come up within plants and there is some accumulation, but in terms of its ability to actually, uh, change or to be contributive towards other plants, we don't have enough research to actually say this. It's really interesting. So I, I would say it looks really good, Lenny. I, I really like what you've put together here. Um, it's a good mix. Um, I'd be careful about just broadcasting, I'd probably be a bit more specific about using sunflowers in some areas for windbreaks and corn as well. Um, I'd probably go with some of the Maximilian uh, sunflowers only because they're perennial. And so uh, you, you could go with, instead of just a self-seeding annual, you could go with something that is gonna create some root mass and keep going. Um, corn may or may not work. I think it's, it's, it's more, it sounds like it, it's worked for you, which is great. 
and probably did. Yeah, I thought that's what I was meaning. Didn't produce a lot of food, but it created a break. A um, couple else, uh, Jerusalem artichoke. Uh, I would go with perennial um, herbaceous windbreak. Um, for some people, survival food. For those of us that have learned how to ferment it, amazing food. Um, you just have to be careful about the inulin because it can create severe gastrointestinal distress um, to the point to where friends and family will not want to eat what you cook for them anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's a really good list. Um, anybody have any other contributions to? Um, to Lenny's list, any other ideas? He's in Chicago. Uh, any other thoughts or seeds that you'd wanna, you can either unmute yourself or put yourself in the chat or the other. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Cool. Okay, so another thing that I've been playing around with in, in my garden to help with weeding is just let strawberries go everywhere. Mm because they're semi evergreen especially if you're looking for more of an extent an aesthetic look too they kind of keep their foliage they turn like a dark purplish here um i know chicago is a little bit colder but it's been pretty successful and i've you know increased my food yield tremendously by just taking all my little pups and moving them around as they as they come up mm. great great addition yeah yeah there there's some great ground covers and uh, that's a that's a brilliant one. Um, yeah, there's there's also a low growing vaccinium, uh, low growing blueberry that you might want to check out. Prostrate. Uh, that's a good one. You could also take a look at just ground cover in terms of like woolly thyme. Uh, some of the heathers would grow really well in your area if you wanted something a bit more um, established, a little bit more perennial. Uh, they're really good. Awesome. Uh, one of the things about the ground cover that I, I guess I didn't ask there, but that I wanted to ask about is the timing of when to plant each thing. And if, if some of the ground cover, like, uh, like ground or like clover or, or like strawberries, we do have strawberries and I was thinking about that, but if they would prevent some of the other larger, cause I, I, I definitely want a windbreak. Uh, and if if it prevented the sunflowers or the taller plants from growing uh, or establishing, uh, and so I'm I'm a little confused about like the timing on when to plant things or to let some things grow before other things sort of take over the ground. I I don't I don't just want there to be this small ground cover that covers everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. And also. I Right. At the end, I wanted squash. I, uh, I, uh, so, and that takes up a lot of space. I know that. Sorry, I don't have those done yet <laughs> at all. Oh yeah, no worries, no worries. I thought I was going to your. Um... What are you looking for? Oh, it's one sixty now. I thought it was one seventy seven for some reason. Um, yeah. So in that case, what I would say is have your have your uprights, have your verticals in an area. So have your sunflowers, your Jerusalem artichoke. If you want to go with some things behind them for more flowers, like your hollyhocks and your foxgloves and all the rest of it, and then have your areas just like you would in a shelter belt where you've got your talls, you've got your, your, your mediums and you've got your ground covers, and then you work your ground covers underneath that. If you work with something that's perennial, um, and has stock that it comes back from, you don't have to worry about it, but if it comes from the ground, you'll have to keep an open space for it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, passive watering, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, for folks that don't know, we, uh, da, 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 sorry, I'm doing two things at once and uh, both poorly right now. So when you're talking about uh, a pathway system or a culture system, there's kind of two conversations here. I just wanna make sure everybody's walking along with us. So um, something that I do quite commonly in urban environments is I'll dig down my pathways and I'll fill them up with wood chips. Um, sometimes I'll even take the overflow from the downspout and I'll put in a big old pipe and then I'll put wood chips around it. Notice how my wood chips are always high because they lose height. And so uh, we mound and we go high in the center because that's where everybody always walks. And so if you want something that's actually level, you go up high. 
and notice that the pipe's not on the ground because we want it to have an uh, a distributed water and wetting pattern like we talked about last time with water holding capacity and cation exchange capacity. So with this system, what ends up happening is this little area right around the pipe becomes this amazing little worm zone. It just becomes prolific. And because of this, you have a soil building area. And one of the things I love about these urban situations is that your pathways can crop as easily as your, your beds. If you take another step and if you inoculate this with mycelium, and specifically this is if you're using willow chips or alder chips, and you end up using something like uh, Stropharia rugosa, which is the wine cap mushroom, which grows really easy in most of the cold climates. Now, all of a sudden you have a pathway that produces soil, produces worms and produces mushrooms. For whatever reasons, people always have this question is, what do you do when the mushrooms grow? You pick them, <laughs> you pick them and you eat them. It's just like any other crop, you pick it and you eat it, especially with mushrooms. So in this situation, um, the maintenance of this is twofold. If you want to harvest worms, if you want to harvest soil, you can. If you want to just keep it as a high water retention area, you can. If you want to leave it, you can. It's just up to you. It's, it's what your needs are. With hoogles, and we're going to be doing a master class in hookah culture with Zach Weiss and myself. Zach's the uh, American progeny of um, prodigy of Sepp Holzer. And we're going to be doing a two class in April, I think April 3rd and 10th, and then the recording will be available. Um, Hugo culture can be very simple, but there's a lot of context specific things. We're going to be doing a lot of case studies and conversations about that. So basically hookah culture is buried wood, it can be large, can be small, can be in the bottom of a pot, can be in the bottom of a, um, a growing container. And what happens is over time, this hookah culture decomposes. Now in cold climates, we're taking a look at usually three to six years before it decomposes. And at this point, this wood is now turned into a high water holding capacity bed, high cation exchange capacity bed, high organic matter, you name it. So if you are actively wanting to harvest the soil, you can, and you could replace it, or you can just leave it. Um, we did my very first hookah culture in the front yard of a buddy's house. And it was a selling feature when he sold it. We thought they were going to hate it. The house then switched hands again, and they removed the hoogle. But now there's this banana-shaped green spot that is always green year-round outside their house. And for those of us that do these projects for years later, um, get used to stalking. So whenever I'm in the, in the city, I go by and I take photos or I take a look on Google Earth. And it's just amazing. It's this little green banana it just stays ridiculously green. So yeah, so you can harvest it, you can remove it. Um, it just depends. Uh, something that Sepp Holzer did uh, a number of times is he would plant his hoogles with potatoes. And towards the time that the hoogle would be harvested, he would leave the potatoes in that year and he'd bring in the pigs. And the pigs would basically churn the hoogle culture and spread it out. And then he'd come in with um, a tractor with a PTO and rake and he would rake it into uh, onto his terrace and then he would just grow. So it was, it was a soil creation strategy that he used. Uh, one of the things that I'm worried about is there's a lot of dispersive clay in the soil mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if i uh, if if those wood chips break down into soil if it'll end up mixing with that clay and if the drainage or the passive water system uh, won't be able to direct or get the water into all the areas that no it won't well, be I, 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 I wouldn't worry about that what'll end up happening is that kind of think about it like um Well, you can think about it like a pipe drain. So a pipe drain will automatically shunt water. And if there's a sponge around it, it absorbs water and it holds water. And the more water it holds, the more organic matter it creates, the more microorganisms it has, and the higher water holding capacity it creates. As you get bioturbation, which is the technical term of when organisms, including earthworms, interact with the soil around it. So in what we call a soil texture interface zone, which will be here's your your parent material and here's your let's say wood chip what will happen is this edge and there was a lot of conversations in this course about edge effect this edge will start to undulate it'll be a, become a crenulated edge 
And so what will happen is that parent material will start to integrate and start to be absorbed and, and, and put into a soil ped. And as this stays here longer and longer, that soil zone will actually move outwards. So you'll have this soil zone that'll move out. So no, the exact opposite will happen. This will become better water storage, better so, uh, water transport to the point that if you keep this pipe in here, if you don't keep the pipe in, it'll become absorpsive, absorb, absorb, absorpsive. <laughs> um, and it will hold and hold and hold and hold more water. And so that water will be taken up higher up in this water train and potentially less down the line. And so what you may do years down the road, this is like 10, 15 years down the road, you may want to redo it, but generally these systems improve over time. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So redirect, re redirecting water. I'd like to capture some extra water from the south roofs on the uh, garage. So we, we took a look at this. I took a look at this before. So currently there's around 30,000 liters coming off of the uh, shed in the garage. Shed in the garage together. Okay. And the growing zone is up here, right? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, right now, this is the other downspout? Yeah. And that's around uh, 45,000 liters on that half. Gotcha. And right now, you're looking at taking this downspout and running it through this alleyway, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, a couple of things here. <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, what you could do is you could take a gutter run, um, pardon me, a downspout run. So let's say, let's do a little cross section here. So let's call this our, our cross section. And let's go A to A, A to A. So if this is A and this is A, uh, we've got our, our house here and it's got, I think it's got a shed roof because that's kind of what I'm seeing here. Mm -hmm. And then we've got our gutter on this side and our gutter on this side. And the gutter on this side for everybody watching goes here and the gutter from this side comes here. So we're going to put little arrows in there. This is something I do for all of my designs because I forget. And when people come back to if somebody, you always have somebody coming back saying, oh, hey, could you take a look at this again? You want to leave a lot of clues for your future self to come back and quickly reference your site. And that's a terrible contrast color with the color of what you have going on. So I'm going to put another arrow in. So this will come up here. And so what I'd probably do, um, and you can do this if you make a trellis. So uh, a colleague of mine, Taylor Krawcheck, does this quite a bit. And uh, it, it ends up looking really nice. Is he'll do like a trellis system where he'll do like a, uh, pardon me, he'll do like a post uh, like so. Cause I know there's a walkway there and then there's this garden bed over here. He'll do a post like this, like a post and beam. And uh, I know we've got our little green zone over here. So we'll put that in. So what he'll do, and I've done this as well, is he'll end up putting a line, a downspout line that comes across the house, comes across uh, this um, trellis and then comes down. And then you can feed that into this area here. And then you can have that um, join up with this and basically the way to do that is you have what's called a big ot um and mm. uh, the way that looks let's see if i can draw it here I'm going black so this is this is here coming in from here and then you'll have a t that'll look something like this and then you can bring in this water into this t and then you can have it continue on down this run here and uh, the black can all be, you can put rock around it so it looks decorative and it doesn't look um, like an industrial landscape. And it's just a great way to bring the water back in and put the water in a productive space in place. So I would do that there. Here, um, what, what do these pitches look like, Lenny? Does this pitch then flow onto this pitch? Is that how this works? Or is this a, a downspout here? Or a gutter? no? Uh, there's a gutter that goes to the alleyway to the left there, uh, right. that collects the. So the the gutter on the left isn't going on site at yeah. all. Uh, currently, this is this is the watershed that I want it to have. Uh, yeah. The gutter on the top left of the garage, I'm wanting to just have it go right over onto the shed. Right. Okay. Uh, so I can get that north side of the garage. 
but so I don't I'm, know how to get this outside of the garage. Yeah. So what I might do is I might change the direction of the gutter and the way that's done is you go up and you basically um, disconnect the downspout, pull out the nails or screws, and then you rejig it. So that way it's now um, going in the opposite direction. So now instead of going this way, you basically change the grade to go this way, reuse that downspout, do the exact same thing I'm talking about here, come across the garage. If the bottom of the downspout doesn't interfere with any sort of doorway, if it does, uh -huh. you can't do it this way. You'd have to do it in an opposite way. You could do it on the backside too, if you had the head height. And then I would basically um, connect them into this downspout and then have okay. them go. And because of this question, and because I know your site, because we've chatted a lot about it, I would probably change the conversation we'd had here. Originally, I think we said that this downspout would go here. I'd probably run it this way just to give more area for this. Like now you've got a, a, a large amount of water that's coming in and going in and going out. So I'd probably change this now and have this water probably just feed this area. Okay. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Yeah, no worries. Uh, we have a high pollution. Yeah, so first flush. So this is another um, case study. Uh, I'm going to go back here. Going to unshare for a second and make sure I've got the right one. Okay. This was the rain garden. Ah, here we go. So this was a design that was done by a colleague of mine that I helped with. And uh, this was a little uh, greenhouse off a garage. And um, you can see the downspout here. And so the downspout was really um, a, a big feature. So what we did is we built in, uh, I built in some rainwater harvesting in here. So we had uh, a first flush diverter. So this came from the roof came down and came into a first flush diverter and then that first flush diverter comes down and um and then uh, the way it works is that it fills up overflows and then that overflow comes down into the the rain barrels and so we had four or five rain barrels in here that were all connected um were plumbed in series so that way it was like one full volume that raised and lowered at the bottom we had this little trickle pipe and this is um, you can see it better here, actually. So this trickle pipe, basically, we drilled a small hole in the cleanout plug, siliconed it in, and then had that trickle pipe come all the way down and into the downspout. Now, what happens is that down that that first flush diverter slowly trickles out, which is what you want. You don't want it to flush out because then all that water comes out, and then flushes out. So if you're worried about uh, some element within your design here of that issue, I would either run that trickle over a gravel pathway or over some area you're not worried about or into the backyard or into the gravel way or something. So that way that water doesn't necessarily come onto site. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, so the top left, uh, I was wanting it to just go out onto the alleyway. Yeah, but that's fine. So we, when you when you have that downspout, sorry. Mm. Uh, when you have that downspout, and you're trying to or, and it's just going into the main. It looks like it's going into the main drain area. Yep. That's also that draining area is also going onto your site, right? So this is a perimeter drain. So this is a perimeter drain that's a French drain around a house. And then that French drain exits the property lower. So it's not in any of the growing zones. Okay. And so you can just take that, that little hose and you can just, I could just put it going out onto the alleyway, right? Yeah, easy. Okay. Is there a way you can set up the drainage so that it actually, no, that that's good. I got it. I can figure out the rest. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, wicking beds and composting system. Highly recommend everyone check this out. This is a little stroke of genius from Lenny here. So we had a chat and we talked a little bit about wicking beds and keeping them connected. And I really like what you've done here. So I'm just going to zoom in. So a uh, little bit of background. So Lenny has this great backyard in his design site that is totally flat, has 
um, uh, concrete pad. And uh, it's a great spot to put in some wicking beds. And so we talked a little bit about using preform wicking beds, using horse trough, galvanized horse troughs. Um, some people get sticker shocked at the price, but I challenge everyone to price out what it'll cost to make it out of wood and then line it and then the labor and, you know, just price it out. And when you take a look at a $275 metal trough, that's already water, um, water tight. It becomes very affordable very quickly. So what we have here is we've got um, inflows. So we've got water that comes in um, from a gutter. And so basically it, it self fills. And what's cool about this is it overflows and then goes back into the landscape. So basically it comes up to a certain level and then that level, because all of these four bins are, um, are connected, um, would fill up and then would overflow and would never saturate. So you'd never get a, an aquatic environment in a terrestrial situation. So one of the things I said to, uh, to Lenny here is that I wouldn't necessarily put a hot compost into this because um, you really want a terrestrial system and you really want to manage moisture in compost. So if you, if you go back to the compost section of the course, you'll see that within a, a Berkeley compost, you know, a one meter cubed um, checking for 58 degrees, you really want that sort of wrung out sponge. And in this system, you'd have wet soil, saturated soil, and you probably have dry soil at the top. So I wouldn't integrate this in here. You could try it because um, you already have made the bed, you could see how it works. Um, but I would probably more so do something where I'd, I'd have an outdoor and indoor worm bed, because these worms, you're going to have to insulate quite a bit of these beds during the winter if you want these worms to survive. And the other thing I, I probably wouldn't do is I probably wouldn't do just a base hygge culture. I wouldn't mind putting a little bit of wood in here. You just have to make sure that you have soil that's coming down because that soil has to be able to wick the water up. So I might do a couple of, you know, small trimmings and branches as a layer, like have that wick and then put that wood throughout because it'll decompose. But I, this is such a, this is a prime place for food growing. I, I wouldn't take up the, the space for compost or hookah culture personally. One of the, one of the things I was trying to do, and maybe, maybe it just wouldn't work, but in the winter time when the worms need heat, I was hoping that they, that it might be able to, to use the heat coming from the compost to keep themselves warm. Uh, but if they're not, if, if it, if it presents like a, a problem with the moisture uh, retention and, or the moisture, then I probably wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So I would just keep these as food. Um, and I would leave the hookah culture for some of the beds that we were speaking about. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Um, just got a message here that, uh, Nicole may have to leave or if Nicole has already left, Nicole, are you still here? I am, but I do have to jump off very quickly. Okay. Um, so quickly then for terrace, since the contour lines are two feet, should I consider terracing every eight to 10? What is the optimal width for terraces and hedge trees and shrubs proposed with site plan? So the way that we size terraces is kind of twofold. There's either, it's the soil you have. And I think with the run you have, you could, you could make terraces, whatever width you have. If you take a look at the Los Plateau here, they could only make it as wide as they could in certain areas. Um, but the optimal width for any terrace uh, if you have the soil to do it would be the width of your implement. So if it's a side-by-side, -side, an ATV, a gator or a wheelbarrow, and then your shrub on either side, um, I would size it for the production. Okay. Yeah. So if I was doing rows that were like 10 to 15 feet to compensate for that, mm -hmm. um, that should, that should be relatively large enough. Yeah, if you have the sizing for it, absolutely. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I would say that would be fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the water management, we probably won't get to the drying because I know you got to run. So instead, what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of show you an example here and I'll, I'll draw a little bit on it to show you um, what I'm thinking. Okay. Um, so this rain garden in particular came from a downspout. And so we lined 
this was Element Eco Designs I was working with, we lined this area to come into our basin. And so with you, um, what I would suggest is something like this. And as you come into the basin, you can kind of see this split. And as soon as you see this split, and as soon as you see this erosion, this is where you want to rock up. So you want to do like a Zuni bowl and rock this up. And you can take a look at the Corvera Coalition's erosion control guide for an explanation of a Zuni bowl. It's basically just a rocked up area. And then there were these two depressions and then a step and then an area. And so what this means is you've got a planting zone, a planting zone and two retention areas. So these areas will retain longer and they were split because we did want to have two different types of plants in here and they don't mingle well. So basically the water comes in, comes over, comes out. And so for you, what I would, I would imagine or suggest is depending on the regulations for the pipeline easement, I'd probably put in a, um, an overflow that came, let's say halfway up height here and then came out. So that way you could overflow or it comes out this side, depending on what plants you had and if you wanted to keep water in there or not. In this situation, we wanted the water come, to come right up to this level sill spillway. And that was really important for the work we were doing. Um, and this could be very, very shallow. This could be like a, a foot or a foot and a half. And so depending on how deep that pipe is buried, if not, unfortunately the bell siphon won't work all that well because you need continually flowing water. Eventually it'll come out. So okay. I would say that this is probably the way to go for you. Um, and then, you know, once you have that level sill, you rock that, you armor that, you armor everything else. Um, you create some aesthetic design. We had a nice little rock um, bridge. You could do some really nice ornamental work at your site there. This is an easy way to plant. If anybody ever does this, you plant, then you put the bucket over top and then you bring in your mulch and then you basically uncover all of the plants. It's a great way to mulch. It's really easy. So you put the mulch in, pull out the pots and it's good to go. Um, this was a, a flag that got in there, uh, but you can see that we've got the trees in there and it just looks like a really nice little area. You'd never tell the implementation that was underneath it. Um, this was a splash guard that came off of the downspout, a little bit of rock work. And there you have it. You've got sort of that overflow that would then went out onto the gutter of the road. And then you have this area right here as well. So I would do something like that. And again, from, from your perspective and your design site, um, I think that uh, you could do two. You could do that one area and then that other area between that, um, between that pipe. And then you could do probably an overflow pipe. That's probably more of a stand pipe that comes up and in on this, this last area. I'd probably do these two areas together actually uh, as the basin. You could always have a trail or a pathway over top of it. But here, probably what I would do is something like this, where, you know, if this is our rain garden and we've got, we always have different areas, um, pardon me, different um, steps, I would do a, uh, a standpipe, something like this that comes up and has an elbow and comes out and then comes out towards your next pond. And the only reason for that is I'd really want to create some head pressure there and allow that to come out onto the pond and then do some tumbling. Whereas if you're coming off of here, you're just not going to get that same amount of drop. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that final question uh, I'm not sure what side to dam or where to put the overflow outlet for the inlet to the rain garden so yeah similar to what I was showing you there I would do a basin and a basin and then pipe them together and then pipe that last bit out so that way there's actually no overflow directly there over land but if it ended up being that you couldn't dig, I would do that dry creek bed between the two. So that way you had sort of mm -hmm. an ornamental feature with some large rocks, maybe some statues, whatever. But that would look beautiful as well. And you wouldn't have to worry about digging into the pipe easement. Okay. Does that answer the question? It does. Okay, awesome. Sorry about that. I didn't see that. Um, but no, it's no worries. I, I'll, I'll email you if I still have questions. Okay. Um, Great. Great. Thank you so much. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Take care, Nicole. Uh, Monica, do we have to create a budget uh, provisioning? Uh, kind of difficult to get prices for each item. No, to receive full marks, you don't have to create a budget. Um, we do like to see something like generally we're thinking about spending this much and generally this is the timing that's going to be the spend. Um, however, if you are going to go into this full time, that's a part of this. You know, part of this work is pricing. Part of this work is estimation. 
And um, it's a whole conversation. It's one of the sessions that Jamie and I are thinking about putting together is pricing. Uh, but generally what we're took, you know, there, there's kind of a cost plus process where you can take a look at what the cost of something is versus what the percentage is on top of it, because there's always going to be acquisition costs. But I would, I would get into the practice of starting to budget. And um, uh, everyone always asks, you know, do you have a sheet for this? Yeah, it's called Excel. <laughs> it's just how many of an X do I have? How many of a Y do I need? How much of the price of it is? When did I access that price right now? Quotes are only being guaranteed for seven days because of the price, price fluctuations. First from um, the, the geo instability from COVID and, and some um, predatory uh, corporate decisions. And now due to um, the invasion of the Ukraine and now the sanctions against Russia. Uh, basically at this point, all clients and students I'm telling, if you think you need something in six months, plan for it now plan to access it, plan to get those materials as soon as possible. You'll probably get in three or four months. Um, we run a family food security program and we're getting everyone to buy their canning supplies now. We got everyone to buy their seeds three months ago. Basically, once you get into the common timing when, uh, let's call it folks who are, are more on a news cycle or more on what is being, what is around them at a, you know, they, they have very little sense of being a time scout that's when the run on everything happens and it's it's almost already, already at 50%. So um, budgets are important. And the great thing is, is if you're working on a budget or if you have a budget budget, if you have a budget that's low, um, if there are elements that you're looking for, you can set alerts on Facebook Marketplace, Kijiji, Craigslist, whatever the local listing is for you, you can look for that, search for that. You can have friends and family looking for elements or plants or whatever, you can bring those in, in a way that works. So yeah, I would absolutely recommend building budgets. Again, we only require a very simple budget for this, for the final design, generally like, what are you looking at? Generally what prices are, um, always have contingency. So my contingencies were originally 5%, moved to 10, moved to 15 and are now at 20, just because there is so much variability these days, especially with shipping and trucking and uh, transportation costs, as we're taking a look at fuel prices right now. So um, yeah, 20% contingency is, has become a, a standard and norm. And my, my friends who run full-time design and install businesses, I don't have a full-time install business. I have a full-time design business. Um, they're, they've moved to 25% contingency and they're, they're now talking about only having a, a 5% or pardon me, a five-day uh, quote hold because of just all the instability. So I don't know if Monica's here. I'm just going to check. And oh, she is. Monica, does that answer your question? Yeah, hey, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will try to do my best. But also in Lebanon, it's not easy now to find any price. You know? no. Our market is collapsing and actually it collapsed. So maybe I'm just going to use some American prices because everything is dollarized here. So I will see what to do. Thank yeah. you. And in, in places where price could fluctuate quickly, like in Cuba and Kenya and Uganda, where I was working, we'd, we'd range it. So we would range what we saw the lowest price it was and what the highest price was. And that range just gave us a sense of how many of what we could get. And so we would have different financial scenarios where if we were getting the average price, we could get X of something. If it moved to its high price, we could only get Y of something. And if it moved to its low price, we might actually switch our financial objectives and quickly purchase everything at that lower price because we found it at a lower price. So financial scenarios can be really useful in places that have um, financial instability. Because uh, in that situation, if something does come up, you can find it really quickly. Uh, the other thing I'll say is that um, one of the best businesses to have in, in, in a financially unstable, um, uh, unstable situation is a nursery. So if there is a availability of plant material, you can start to, to garner and learn how to propagate and propagate. It's an amazing business. I was floored at the nursery businesses that were, were just doing phenomenally well in Kenya and Uganda at times when um, uh, they had lots of political and economic instability. Uh, at those times, people are always looking for more food. And, and when they were growing food related plants, starts, things like that, they were doing phenomenally well. So something to think about. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you're welcome.
Great folks. Um, any other questions that have come up during this? I don't see anything new in the chat uh, or elsewise. Any other follow-up questions to what we spoke about before I go into the review of the final design? Okay. All right. So as we get into the concept plan, there's a couple of things to think about. First and foremost is a concept plan is a working plan. So working plans are not final and never are because what we think about in our minds and on paper never end up being the truth of what's in the ground. So years ago, I moved away from calling it a final plan and just moved into calling it a working plan. And so this working plan is a working plan and can change and can grow. And it's important to keep it that, that way. You'll see down here that we have a vertical title bar. As I've said multiple times before and in the tutorials, if you're already using a horizontal, use a horizontal. We just put something in here as a placeholder. So this existing plan, this is your base map. This is what everything looks like. Um, we just wanna make sure that we start with the, that existing and then we move right into concept. So what are the different large scale design elements? And this is sort of 30,000 foot view. Then we get into concept plan. What's that statement about the entire site? You might be reusing this from Zone one, it might be the same. You might be reusing it from the client survey. Then we get into goals. So what are those specific goals? And we're working with smart goals, so specific, measurable, assignable, uh, realistic, and time-related. So we really want to make it specific. Again, we just have the vertical placeholder here. If you're using horizontal, just move the boxes around as you need to. Use that legend as necessary. Now. You'll see in this one, we've included a number of different elements into this plan. If you wanna create separate slides for this, please do. You don't have to make this the same. So you could have the design goals, the proposal zones, the pathways, the fences, and the gates all together. It's just a way of including a lot of elements in one slide. If you wanna separate them out, you can. If it feels too cluttered, separate them out. If it feels like there's more specificity, separate them out. Um, you've, you've been doing this long enough with this template, you should know this by now that if it's too cluttered, really wanna make sure it's clear. The water management plan, what we wanna see is where water flows on site, where you're holding it, where it's going and where the overflow is. Always design for overflow. Everything we do is a drop in the bucket. When you take a look at the sky and what it can produce and what it can put into the landscape, it's a drop in the bucket. If you wanna do a new, um, chart of all of the different areas and the water they will absorb and how much water you're hoping to absorb. And I'm thinking, Lenny, this might be a good thing for you. You've got a lot of permeable areas. Now, all of a sudden, this area is going to get 80,000 liters of water because it's the 30 and the 30 from the house and the 20 it would get anyway. So that might be a really good exercise for you to think about the number of liter gallons of water that are going to flow on here. Make sure to give us a sense of what irrigation will look like if you're going to put it in. Make sure to give us a sense of all of those different elements. This is a great place to put a grayscale map of your concept design, not your base map. Great place to do an entire design here. And you may want to do a big old map of just that design. And you'll see in a couple of these elements that that's what people did. It's what I do. Um, soil fertility. So specifically, how is soil going to be managed? Again, grayscale map and then browns, greens, you know, all of these areas of what looks, where's the compost? Um, what is there a map? You may have a phasing or a, a maintenance plan for your soil maintenance and fertility when you're applying compost, when you're going to change things out, when you're going to chop and drop. All of those are important things. So concept plan could also include a phasing plan or a cycle plan. Could be a circular map circular calendar that shows what maintenance looks like for the different areas and different times. We have a vegetative element, so a real specific one just on vegetation. So this is where we're going to be specific about plants. This is where we get our big planting plans. Sometimes we have two of those. Uh, this is our concept plan and map. So you'll see here is I've created this chart for folks and you'll see here these are the instructions. Click here to access, make a copy of the chart. Don't ask me for permission. Just like all of these, it's not about permission, it's about making a copy. Enter your specific project details, copy the cells you wanna display and paste here. So how this works is when you get to this chart and you make a copy of it of your own, what you can do is you can 
copy the cells you want. So I could copy, let's say from 1A to 20P, if that's the one I wanted, I command copy or right click copy. And then I go back to my portfolio and I right click uh, paste or insert um, chart. And it's amazing. It just completely brings that information in. And if you change it on the chart, it changes in the slideshow. Amazing little piece of technology here. That's phenomenal. Uh, you can see here that we've got um, year one uh, and nice to see a one to five year budget. So you'll see in the chart, we actually have one, two, three, four, and five. Um, some folks didn't figure this out. So I'll just say it clearly winter, spring, summer, and fall. So these are seasons, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. You can change them if you like. Um, just want to make sure that folks get that. Uh, finally, we get into permaculture principles. So what were the principles you used? You can use some images from the site. What were some of the social permaculture elements or concepts? How are you interacting? If you're doing a public site, this can be signage or telling people when things are ripe or generally what the concepts are. Finally, we've got our SWOT analysis. So, and this is a SWOT analysis of your design. Um, some folks have kind of veered off of this concept, but the SWOT analysis is of what you produced or the assignment. So what are the strengths of this design? What are the weaknesses of this design? What are further opportunities from this design? So we're asking you to take another step within your design process and ask, where is this great? What threatens this design? So something that was um, a big game changer for me, and I did, started doing this six years ago, call it red team design. I always budget for at least another designer or two to take a look at my design. I give them a red marker figuratively and literally sometimes, and I say, tell me why I'm wrong. So they come onto my design site. Sometimes I hire them and they come on. Sometimes it's a trade for hour or hour. You could do this with other individuals in this class. If you, if you saw some great um, work and you're like, oh yeah, so-and-so would be a great person to do design trade. They then come in and they look at your design and they, they question what's going on. I did a design for this family, Rise Over Run Farm. Uh, it's on my website, amazing folks. And uh, I think it was like 1800 millimeters of rain a year. For you Americans, I would definitely take a look at what the conversion is. I'm sure it's monstrous. It was for us almost two meters of rain. And my challenge was to turn water into chickens because they were chicken farmers and they had too much water and the water was drowning out the chicken. So we created a, a terraced hugaculture system that would produce and hold the water and produce fodder for the chickens. And a colleague of mine looked at it and goes, why aren't you doing ducks? And it was just, it was a blind spot in me. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> wet area wet fowl. I just got enamored with the design directive that the clients gave me. And we do, we all do it. I didn't see it, but that's one of the reasons why I have red team design is that they come in and you can't, how do I say this? Um, the exponential design advancement I had when I involved red team design, when I, when I gave up the hubris of being right and realized that one person should never design one site was exponential. I went from being an okay designer to a very good designer because all of a sudden I had all of these little friends and colleagues in my mind when they would look at my designs and go, well, why didn't you think of this? And it's just like, oh, interesting. Why do I have that blind spot inside of what I do? And that, that created a whole nother conversation about design and my work and all the rest of it. But I really, really advise you do that. Um, that might mean reaching out to somebody else in this class. And we do that anyways with peer review. So you know, with only one week left, I don't know if I would enter into that, but that's the concept plan, folks. Any specific questions about the concept plan or our final working plan? Any specific or general questions? You, of course, can add more than you want here. Um, and generally, I like to see bigger plans. Uh, these can, can kind of be those title plans, but then we have bigger plans with legends and all the rest of it. But um, it all works out. It's all just fine. Again, if you're, including, um, if you're, no. including, I'll, I'll just finish. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. If you're including images, you do have to attribute those images, full URLs, full access dates. And again, if you want to put a uh, attribution resource citation slide at the end and just do superscript for these, that's totally fine. Okay. Who was asking the question? That was me. <laughs> Go ahead. Michael. Um, I'm, uh, I'm actually glad you said, cause I keep making more and more slides for each thing that I'm talking about. I'm like sitting here, I'm like, I might as well write a book report, you know, cause it, it's, I'm used to writing big papers and stuff, you know, so this, and so I'm trying, and I actually did 
write a report before I, and now I'm trying to smash it all down. And then I look at the examples and they're like so simple and nice and clean. They only have, I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to cram it all into one thing. And, and just so you know, when you look at my project, it'll probably be kind of long. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. You know, all of my designs come with uh, a feasibility uh, report when we start. And so, you know, that feasibility report is what, an inch, maybe an inch and a half. It includes everything from a, a key line scale of permanence for all things agricultural. So, you know, we've got a full title, like there's the table and contents. I don't know if that's gonna show up appropriately, but you know, I hear you, there's a lot of data to bring into this. And then, you know, for us, the way that I do my GIS mapping, we have these monster maps that come into it. Um, and I like putting them into this design portfolio so folks can get a sense about what this looks like and what it is. And then uh, to, towards the end, this looks better. Um, we ended up showcasing what that final design looks like. And within a feasibility report, we've, we're really taking a look at a concept. So we're not getting into detailed full design. So this is a good example. So we go into full design spec, showing what the different areas look like, showing what they might, might be. Um, and what's interesting is uh, since we've created, since I created this um, template, uh, a number of the instructors in the course have started to use it because it is so comprehensive. And so they're starting to use it with clients because it is so comprehensive. And that's what's great about this from a student's perspective is that you can strip out um, some of the SWOT analysis. I use a SWOT analysis for all of my design, uh, but I use it underneath the key line scale of permit. So I do a SWOT for climate, topography and water and access and vegetation. I, I do it for existing and I do it for proposed. So I, I tell the client fully what the potential weaknesses are of, of the planting plan that we put into place. Because there will be, there, there will always be positives and, and, and negatives. Um, one of the big negatives, and I think we're all, I think everyone is, has put this in their threats, is that with climate change, we don't know what's coming. Um, we know that the variability is going to be higher because the energy within the atmosphere is higher. We know that the highs are going to be higher and the lows are going to be lower. The wets are wetter, the dries are drier, the storms are more intense, the, the droughts are more extensive. Um, so within that, uh, I highly recommend if you are going to become a designer and um, a student, now a colleague of mine in Cyprus who took the advanced climate resiliency design said it best. And I hadn't realized this because I, I did this naturally in my design process for folks that were looking for resiliency. That advanced climate design resiliency is, is the next step in design. Because when you start taking a look at where the climate is going in your design site, you start thinking in 25 year increments. Okay, if we do move a whole zone warmer or if we do move a whole iteration drier, do we have plants that we are currently, do we have production plants that we are currently trialing that we can quickly move into? And so that's a really important part for those of us. I think on the urban scale, this isn't as important, but on a rural scale, uh, for a production scale, for a farm scale, it's, it's necessary. We have to be taking a look at climate change seriously in terms of, of propagation. And one of the things we do in that course um, is we take a look at the change in climate for Copenhagen classification of your site, and then those Copenhagen classifications around the world and what we can learn from them for this site. And it's one of the most illuminating uh, assignments and it's, it's heavy research, but when you see what other people are growing in a zone, hotter or drier or whatever, um, it really changes what you think you might be doing on that site. So Michael, I completely get you. Um, put as much detail as you want into it. Uh, know that when and if you decide to pass this over to the client, you'll be stripping out a lot of design elements. You know, I would keep your student portfolio, copy and paste the entire portfolio, and then strip out anything that's more specific to the course. So, you know, OSU PDC Pro would turn into the project name and the city and country regions potentially, or just the project name. And then maybe the design, um, the design company name or your name uh, prepared by, uh, I would, I would keep SWATs, but I would be very conscientious about what SWATs I would produce and, uh, and introduce to a client. Um, 
because you want to make sure that you've thought about them. Sometimes this water for, uh, for you. And when you go through them, you're like, Ooh, I still haven't dealt with that. Okay. How am I going to deal with that? And so once you do, it's, it's coming to that conversation. Usually for us, the concept plan and the phasing plan is one of the most important elements for client design because they want to know what steps they should take and when they should take them. So that can be something that I'll spend you know, 25 to 30% of a final report on in terms of the amount of time I put into it, because it takes a lot of time and energy. A little uh, tidbit that I picked up years ago um, was starting to use Google Docs and using Google Docs online in field. So I would take my notes directly into my Google Doc while I was in the field. This meant that all my notes were directly in my report and I could tran uh, transcribe them directly into it. And this is gonna be one of the first years I'll be working with an editor who will then take raw notes. They're also a designer, but they're an editor first and foremost and a writer, and they'll be transposing that into this report. I think we talked before, my, my writing isn't bad, but it takes a long time for me to do it. It's not something that in terms of great skills I have. Um, so it takes a long time for me to do those types of things. So I'm always looking for hacks to, to move ahead. Any other questions about this concept plan? You've got a final week to put it together. Something that I know Andrew has said in all of his emails, but people always forget all of your assignments are due on Monday. So if you have outstanding assignments, they all must be due Monday. I have a question. Go ahead, Lenny. Uh, you mentioned we could forego the zone one. Mm -hmm. uh, do we still need to submit it as foregone or something like that? No, if you just, uh, if, if when you submit your concept plan, you just let me know, or your, your building survey, really, when you put your building survey and just say, yeah, I decide to skip zone one uh, in favor of more time for concept, that's fine. Okay, and what about the, uh, the re responses? Uh, <clears throat> if we don't have like one of our uh, responses to other people done, will we fail? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, we as graders don't handle that. Um, you probably have to take a look at the rubric um, and take a look at that. I can I can do a bit of research and reach out to Dow and Andrew and let them know what needs to be done for that. But uh, I know in Andrew's recent email, he had the specifications for certificate. Um, and this, this will probably, uh, upset a lot of people, but um, your PDC certificate isn't checked anywhere in the planet. No one's ever asked me for my PDC certificate. No one's ever wanted to see my card, my badge, my PDC badge. It hasn't mattered. Um, every once in, a while, once in a while, you will find, you know, organizations that are like, oh, if you had a PDC, that'd be great. And they'll, they'll want to know you did it. I, I've had organizations like that and I've never had to produce it. So I just want to put that out there. <laughs> As Bill Nelson said, the only thing you certainly know after you finished a PDC is that you finished a PDC. I don't know if you're better. I don't know if you're a good designer. I have no idea. I don't know if you listened to what I took. I don't know if you know, you're good, no idea. Um, so you know, keep that in mind. If, if you ever go and if you want to, you know, do a quote unquote um, masters in permaculture, which you can through some of the uh, Permaculture Institute of North America, Permaculture Research Institute, Delvin Delvin Silkinson, um, who's created some great teaching resources for permaculture. If you're interested in teaching, he's got some phenomenal resources. If you're interested in teaching, I highly recommend you take uh, permaculture teachers training with Jude Hobbs of Cascadia Permaculture. Phenomenal, phenomenal educator. I brought her up to Canada for the first time going on now 13, 12 years ago and uh, just finished a hedgerow course with her. But yeah, certificate, uh, no one's going to be asking. So um, yeah, uh, but I will check in on that. It's one of those things that we don't deal with as instructors. It's something that gets managed by another aspect of the course. So I don't have that right on hand. A good question. Other questions? Okay, well, folks, um, coming up is I will be sending out an email about a webinar for next steps that Jamie and I will be putting together. If you'd like to join, 
it's going to be both educational, but also um, crowdsourcing. We want to know what people want to know. We want to know what we should be building over this next couple of years. I've had a couple of Facebook posts about that, and it's been phenomenal seeing colleagues of mine having specific areas that they want information on. I'll probably do a, a life design presentation during that webinar, talking a little bit about what's next and how to go about it and how I would approach it. Um, but it'll be a big Q and A conversation. It's going to actually, I even know when it is because we set the date. I just haven't built the webinar yet. It's going to be the 16th of March at 6 PM. So if you want to block off on your calendars, it'd be great to see you there. There's a number of phenomenal courses coming up with regenerative living dot online. So if you're interested in those, uh, definitely, um, check out in the announcements previously. Um, we've got just an incredible number of courses coming up and it's going to be really phenomenal year for education. So if you are looking into water, if you're interested in grazing, um, if you're looking into production systems, we're going to be doing a deep dive into production systems as well and uh, building quite a lot of content. Beyond that, this is the last time I get to talk to you. So um, thank you for being part of the course and not because you were students, but because looking out into the landscape of what we're seeing uh, in the world. And I've been in at this now for 13 years in this vein and probably 20 years in a bunch of other, what are we going to do conversations? I have seen more change within the permaculture realm, the regenerative design realm than anything else I've been involved in. And I remember shaking on my very first PDC, uh, raising my hands after I'd heard the prime directive of permaculture and the 12 principles as laid out by David Holmgren. And I was saying, this is the closest thing to a, a life creed, a life ethic I feel I could, I could spend the rest of my life with. I'd, I'd been a very wayward youth. I looked at a lot of religions and most of them were, everyone's great, except for those people when they do those things. And it just turned me off of a lot of groups and conversations. But here was permaculture saying, take responsibility for yourself and for that of your children. Take care of the earth. It's our first asset. Take care of each other. It's our second asset. And when there is surplus, give back to both. And I wrote in my journal and I found it a couple of years ago. I'd rather fail at this than succeed at pretty much anything else. And it has been a phenomenal ride for me. I can't imagine what my life would have been if I had gone into a more conventional lifespan or occupation or conversation. I have met the best people on the planet doing this work uh, locally, internationally, you folks. This is an amazing way of finding like minded people and really starting to find common ground. I know a number of friends and family who um, have said, my next partner will have a PDC and we'll have this. <laughs> it's, it's a quality in a conversation. So I just want to thank you for being part of this course. I want to thank you for your efforts. I want to encourage you to move forward. Um, there's no one I've seen in our class who I wouldn't highly recommend to continue on in this work. I think you have all done a phenomenal job. You're at a kindergarten level, but you've all done a phenomenal job. So just put as much effort as you can into rinse and repeating. Everything is about repetition. Everything is about doing another design, smaller scale, larger scale, reaching out to mentors, reaching out to colleagues, building interactive and, and interconnected communities and realizing that our, our time is now. Um, that there has never been a more immediate moment for this work. And I don't know what the future holds, but I know that with enough of us in action, whatever comes, the time spent is well spent. It's more joyful. Um, it usually has better cider in it. Uh, it usually has much better food in it. And it usually has much better parties in it. The parties, like the permaculture parties I've been to have just been uh, amazing conversations where you go from like having a, a, a foot game to then talking about soil science to then you know, having somebody's homemade cider to then having somebody's homemade whatever. It's just phenomenal humans. And so as the most recent phenomenal humans I've met, I will say good luck. Um, I hope you have a wonderful run at this work. I hope you enjoy this work. And if I can aid you in any way, shape or form, it would be my great pleasure. So with that, unless anybody has anything else they want to add, uh, we'll say goodbye and uh, hopefully we'll meet sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Best of luck, everybody. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you, Javin. You've been wonderful.
Oh, thank Amazing. you. Amazing. I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Akadina says, thanks so much. Noreen says, thanks so much in the chat. All right, folks, let's get out there and plant some trees. Take care. <laughs> Bye.